Whoa. I think Benji's gonna like this. Garage time. Welcome back everyone. I just returned from a week off. I went to the Hill Country Rally for those of you that don't know. Here's a quick little video on that event. Really fun. But I'm working on Benji's car again today. I ordered a bunch of parts for it. Brake lines and hoses and oil line parts, gaskets, all the things that we need to get it to run. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this thing will run today. The biggest issue we gotta fix right now is the oil leak right at the thermostat. So I've ordered some clever parts from Elephant Racing that I think are gonna allow me to snug up the lines without damaging any of the threads. I think the issue was the old nut was not, the threads were damaged on the nut or it was like elongated or ovaled and it wasn't allowing it to clamp right. I've gone over the threads with this new nut from Elephant Racing and now these just screw right on. So there's no friction on the nut. It goes all the way down to the bottom for all four of these oil connections. And that is really gonna get us the maximum clamping pressure. The lower two lines are tight and I only, I only replaced one of the nuts and then these upper lines, you know, they have a little anti-seize on them, but this is how the nut should go on. And I'll tighten this one first and then I'll put this one on second. Oil leak is fixed. I'm so relieved. That was a big job. Now I'm on to the brakes. Just got to keep all that fluid where it belongs. I made a mess down here with the brake lines. I just flushed them out and got them replaced. So this is the flex line that was completely corroded and really firm. So let me show you what I found. That's the driver's side and that's the passenger side. I cut the brake line in order to get my socket on there. Since they've been on this car so long, I really wanted to get a good grip on the fitting. To get the old ones off, I just snipped them, put the socket on there. To get the new ones on, you really need the flare nut tools, which I have, and that's also helpful for torquing them down correctly. But what I wanted to show you is both of these are completely swollen shut. That's the end of the brake line, and it's completely solid. You can't, you can't blow through it at all there's no way you can blow through it. Um, that's why I couldn't get the back brakes to work or even bleed them. It takes a lot of years to swell the brake line completely shut. Just in the process of getting the bumper back on, because all the oil leaks are fixed, and kind of ran into some interference here with the muffler. So this side was, is clearing. The muffler, for whatever reason, has a lean to it. I think the muffler's bent. And also there's been some body damage back here to this corner. So the bumper is kind of bent in a little bit. So I just finished kind of pulling this out, 
So there's just a tiny bit of clearance between the bumper and the muffler. So hopefully that doesn't make any contact. It's actually missing one of the straps. So I, I moved it from one side to the other, trying to, to hold it in. So now there's clearance on both sides. I hope this is gonna be okay for now. Hey Alex, can we do a video uh, ride soon? So I'm just gonna get this bumper on and then put it down and we can go. You're gonna go right now? Just come back before it gets dark. See what I mean about the damage? This got pushed in at some point. So all these things trickle into something else. So we're just doing the best we can on this car. It's hard for me not to fix everything, but there's only so much time we can devote to a car that's not mine. This is fun to do one-handed. Boom. Yes. Yeah, the bumper's on and just gonna show you before I put the tire back on, this bracket's attached and this is something I'm gonna apologize in advance for for Benji. I made this a little aluminum plate. There's some factory hardware that locks the oil tank in here to the chassis, but I just used some generic stuff. I don't have the right parts and we're getting down to the wire to take this thing for a ride. So this, you can improve it if you want, but it's strong enough as it is. All the leaks have been taken care of. I've made sure there's no more leaks here, especially at these oil lines. There's nothing leaking right there at all. You can take this wood out. That was holding the, the thermostat in while I was tightening the nuts, but everything should stay in place now. You can see how tight these fit here. Also, this is a temporary clamp. Um, I'm not sure the factory clamp is gonna fit tight enough. So I might leave this one in, just clean up the corners. This is also aluminum and it's, the tire gets really close to this right here. So I've already adjusted the throttle linkage and the clutch. So the clutch is working. To test the clutch engagement, it should not grind at all in reverse. And so I'm able to, get that done. I did have to shorten the clutch cable a little bit because on the stock 3.2 exhaust, it runs right in front of the clutch adjuster. The clutch cable runs alongside this, the transmission there and then it's held captive by a little boss in the side cover. And then this is the clutch arm right here. This is what the clutch cable pulls against. So you can see if I hadn't cut the cable, it would have run right into the exhaust. And so I cut it so it's just barely got some clearance there and I'm almost out of adjustment here on the cable. So this is not ideal. There's some adjustment at the pedal box, but I didn't want to rip into the pedal box right now. So this does work. It will engage reverse without grinding. So I think we're ready to take it for a ride. So first test drive, basically you still have a lot of temporary wiring. Some of this is old stereo stuff, but this is the wiring to the harness for the 3.2. 
I'm gonna show you how that connects in a little bit. There's really only a couple wires, but it's all temporary. This is the same adapter I used on the engine test stand. So we'll go over that in a minute, but let's just give it a run. I'm in a parking lot. So the nice thing about this engine is all you do is turn the key and it idles and starts perfectly. It doesn't matter if it's cold or not. This is fuel injection, computer controlled. It is just real smooth. I still have yet to connect the gauges, no tachometer yet, nothing like that. I will do that probably tomorrow morning, but let's uh, take it around, test the brakes, make sure we're working like it should. Brakes actually stop pretty even. It's plenty of torque. You can start in second gear, no problem. Oh. I think Benji's gonna like this. Awesome, good job. I'm back out in the garage today. I'm gonna to tackle the electrical and tidying up all the wiring. But first impressions on the car is that it is, it's great. The engine is super smooth. The power delivery is great. There's no surprises, it just goes. Uh, 2,500 and up, it's gone. Like it's such a light car. It really has great power delivery. I have only gone half throttle at the most and I'm really unable to stretch its legs because the car is not registered and not insured. So, uh, and it's not my car. So I'm taking it easy in parking lots. I've done a couple good runs here in, this, in just the neighborhood streets. The engine is not super punchy. Um, it's basically like a whooshing just power, super smooth. Um, it's a 1987 smog engine for the most part. Regulations in 87 were pretty strong, so you're not gonna get that great throttle response, the wham wham. It's basically just like a, a boost of power and then, and then it's off. So the transmission's working well, the clutch is working well, brakes working. Fuel system is a lot better now that there's enough gas in it. So. I think we're off to the races. Okay, this looks a little messy right here, but I just want to highlight what's needed. Um, inside this black bundle, there's one heavy gauge wire. It goes direct to the battery. It's unfused. It's what powers the fuel injectors. The other important thing is this four pin connector. This is part of the factory harness, the one with the red dot. And there's really two wires that are needed. One is ignition power. It's denoted as 15. That's connected to the fuse block up in the trunk area. And then also this yellow wire goes right to the ignition switch. So what that does is it will turn the fuel pump on when you, the key is on the start position. It'll turn some fuel pressure on, and then it also gets a signal to turn the ECU on. The ECU also controls the fuel pump. So the fuel pump is connected right here, this red green wire is connected to the fuel pump. So I'm using this terminal block to kind of break things up a little bit, but there's two connections to the ECU, the fuel pump, and that's about it. Uh, that's all you need to make the engine run. I did not cut any of the factory wires on both the 912 harness or on the 3.2 engine harness. Everything is run side by side. In some cases, we do make connections, and I'll try to explain what connections are needed. Inside the car is the DME relay and the altitude sensor. This is the altitude sensor, and obviously the ECU is here. So I'm gonna remove the seat. We're gonna mount these under the, the seat, and then we're gonna route the wiring up into the trunk area so it's not, it's not here in the, in the way. Thank you. 
and see what happens when water gets in, just sits on these floors under the rubber mat and causes rust from the inside out. So definitely want to clean that up a little bit. And then this is where the wire comes from the engine bay or under the car. It's got this big heavy grommet. It's not fully seated right now because I've been shifting the wire around. But we need to route this wire up tight against the body like that under the carpet. And then this will get mounted under the seat right here. We won't drill any holes in the car. Probably gonna weld some tabs on top. So I don't want any holes where we don't want holes on the bottom of the car or screws poking through. And now I have those tabs, one there in the corner, one on the other corner, and then one underneath the seat pan or seat rail. So that's gonna allow this harness to fit in there tight. So I'm gonna spray this or paint this with some black paint and then let that dry. And also I'll put some plastic sleeve, PVC sleeve over that so it doesn't cut into this. Also, you guys notice I had disconnected the battery and also removed the ECU before I did any welding. The energy of the welder and the arc of the welder can actually cause some damage to the ECU. This is the PVC sleeve that I have left over from my 356 wire harness. This is the same stuff the factory used. It's the wire harness material. So this is uh, able to slip over. This is an extra piece of strip that I used. This will slip over. And then where the weld is, you can cut the backside so that the top is continuous, but the backside has a relief. So see how the back is cut away? That's where the weld is. So if you just slip this on, it'll, it'll hold the wires without chafing or, wire, or causing any damage. Okay, I've added some studs to the floor to attach the ECU. And I did my best. Uh, this is a stud welded or a weld nut welded to the bottom of the car. But this part of the car, let me turn the lights on. This part of the car is rusted. So you saw how it hit, water had collected down here. It's probably the lowest part of the car. And these are rust holes just cleaned off with my wire wheel. That was a hole right there. I just did the best I could to weld onto stuff. But I'm really nervous about this. This can't get the ECU wet. So I'll fill it with some seam sealer or some goop or something. Don't want any water getting on the ECU. I'm gonna show you what's going on in the engine bay. I got all this wiring here kind of tucked down. Actually, it goes behind the AFM airflow meter and routes along the back there. Uh, there's other wires that come along here for the fuel injectors. This is the wire It comes along here to the ignition coil. These wires, I'm just holding them here temporarily. These are the 912 wires and these are the sensor ones. This is what's gonna pick up the temperature sender and so forth. So I haven't connected that, but that's what this connector here is. This has all the senders for the engine. Um, there's gonna be some connections, a little adapter to go from those round terminals to these flag terminals. And like I said, I'm not cutting anything. I'm just routing the two harnesses side by side. This is the one that is the Motronic fuel injection. That wire goes all the way along the factory location, all the way down through, um, goes through this grommet right there. That's a new hole and a new grommet. And then this white wire is a little bit long, but it's going to where that red wire was. The red wire is the old ignition coil power. And now I'm using this white wire to go to the ECU power. So not that much different. Everything is pretty much stock. It should still start right up. Yeah. Okay, the last thing I want to try is to get the tachometer working. And this is a big task because one, it's a six cylinder instead of a four cylinder. And we want to keep the vintage gauges if at all possible. So the other issue is the output of the Motronic is what they call low voltage. It's the output from the computer as opposed to the output from the ignition coil. The ignition coil has these high voltage spikes that the tack is designed to sense. So because this is an old ignition coil style tack, we're trying to control it 
with the Motronic and we need to convert it to six cylinders. So this is the device, it's called Tack Adapt and it's from Ashlock Tech. Uh, it's supposed to be the magic ticket to go for the 3.2 engine swap and it's got a whole host of instructions. I'm going to run a temporary wire through the clock area or through the radio area just to get the signal and there's a bunch of settings on here we need to change to try to make it work. I just want to see if it works at all because this was a non-driving car when I got it. I'm not even sure the tachometer works as a four cylinder. so. I just wanna get some kind of movement out of it and then we'll dial it in and calibrate it. Okay, I got wires all over the place again. This is typical how I work. I usually do one system at a time. I just finished the whole engine swap wiring conversion. Now I have a whole new set of temporary wires. Basically this thing has um, four wires going into it. Red is switched power, brown is ground, and then the blue is going right to the back of the tachometer and then this wire here, it's kind of a lighter brown. It is coming from the Motronic signal. That's the tack signal from the Motronic. And this thing has a couple LEDs inside. So when I switch the power on, I should see some lights inside here, and then it should start blinking when it gets a signal. And we'll keep an eye on the, uh, the tachometer. So let's turn the key. Oh, I saw here turn the key, we get one little blink of a light and then start it up. Looks like that's blinking really um, kind of quickly, but it's blinking. And then the tachometer did move. Yeah, it's working. So typical bouncy uh, video tack, but it seems right. When I get a little more time, I'll set up my uh, tack dwell meter. I can hook that up to the spark plug leads and just make sure the tachometer is somewhat calibrated. Not that I would probably adjust the tachometer, but I just want to make sure the conversion's correct. Uh, it sounded like 3000 RPM was really 3000. I think it's fine, but uh, also, also obviously I had to run the wiring. I plan to mount that adapter right on the back of the tachometer. So it'll be a real short wire that takes the signal that would normally go to the tachometer. It'll go into the box instead and then right out of the box into the tachometer. And then there's some power uh, right next to the uh, tachometer. So that should be a real, a real tight little system without having a whole lot of extra wiring on there. Maybe just Velcro it to the back of the tachometer. And I think it's a good solution, another clever product. So that's really the main part of this engine swap. Um, like I said, I still have some torsion bar stuff to do. That's kind of above and beyond. Take a guess uh, in the comments below. Tell me how many hours you think I've put into this engine swap. Um, I think it's really kind of a two-step process. One was the engine swap and kind of getting the engine diagnosed and running and ECU troubles. And then two was kind of getting the car ready to drive again. Um, it was a car that had been sitting for a long time. And so when you add both of those up, how many hours do you think I put into it? It's a good project because I'm going to be doing a lot of the same work to my car. And I've learned a lot about the 3.2 and integrating it in and troubleshooting. You know, my car is a 911, so it will go in a lot easier. But we overcame a lot of problems with this one. And uh, I hope Benji likes it. So... Stay tuned, hopefully we'll get a reaction. He'll be here on the weekend. So as you see this, he'll probably be here. That'll be fun. Take care.